Oh, hello, welcome back. Part 2 about the truth of division by zero. So like I said in part 1, this typically involves some very advanced, very obscure maths. Few professional mathematicians understand how real theory truly works, and yet that is exactly what I want to attempt to do today. Our approach will be as follows. We will construct a very simple real algebra, but at the same time, I'm going to give you a geometric interpretation of how it's being constructed as we are building it. Okay, buckle up, bucko, this is going to be good. We begin our journey with the integers, and we're going to play a little game. We're going to pretend the integers are all that we know about. We don't know about fractions, we don't know about rational numbers, we don't know anything besides 0, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2, etc. And furthermore, we also don't know how to do division. For example, we don't know how to calculate 3 divided by 1. Even though 3 divided by 1 is still an integer, it doesn't matter. We can't divide any integers at all. There are three things we can do, however. We can add integers, we can subtract integers, and we can multiply integers. But that's it. Hmm, sounds pretty limiting. But the point is, we're going to manually reconstruct division from scratch. And it's important that we do this now, because to construct a wheel algebra, we're going to be modifying our number system at this very fundamental level. Alright then, how do we do it? First, I'm going to define a new type of mathematical object called a fraction. Remember, we don't know about fractions yet, only the integers. Now, a fraction will be defined as a pair of integers, a and b, where b is not 0. For example, 1, 1 is a fraction, negative 2, negative 5 is a fraction, 0, negative 3 is a fraction, but negative 3, 0 is not a fraction. Okay? You get the point. A pair of integers with the second one not 0. Next, I will define a quality between two fractions. AB equals CD, if and only if AD equals BC. For example, we can say 1, 3 is equal to itself, because 1 times 3 equals 3 times 1. And 2, 6 is also equal to itself, because 2 times 6 equals 6 times 2. In fact, it's pretty obvious any fraction will be equal to itself. Okay, but that's not the only way fractions can be equal. If you look closely at these two examples, you'll see that they are in fact equal to each other. 1 times 6 equals 3 times 2. Hmm. What about 3, 9? Yes, this one is also equal. What about 2, 8? Ah, in that case, no, not equal. One more example, 1, 4. 1, 4 is equal to 2, 8, yes. Hopefully you can see what's going on here. These fractions in our game are behaving exactly like normal fractions do in standard arithmetic. Well, of course they are. That's the whole point. And it's easy to see why as well, if you think about it. In standard arithmetic, when two fractions are equal, then it follows that AD equals BC. But that's exactly the condition we're using to decide whether the fractions in our game are equal. In other words, whenever I write down one of these pairs of integers, you can just intuitively think of it as a fraction. And if you can do that, this next bit will be as clear as a bell. We're going to define the four basic operations. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Here is the definition of addition. Look closely. Do you see it? It's the same way we add fractions in standard arithmetic. And that's the whole point. We are reconstructing the fractions from scratch. So next up is subtraction. And of course, we define it like this. Now for multiplication, this is the easiest one of the four. And lastly, division is almost the same, except C and D get swapped around, and there's also this little exception, C can't be zero. For totally mysterious reasons. Okay, so altogether, these are our six definitions that define everything we need to know about fractions. And by the way, if you've never seen this before, this is the true formal definition of the rational numbers right at the heart of maths. The only thing left to do is convert everything we've done into standard notation. And it's simple. We redefine the integers with the following rule. The integer x equals the fraction x1. 
Okay, I think it's best to try an example now. Remember at the start how we didn't know how to calculate 3 divided by 1? Well, now we can do it. First, we convert the integers into their fraction form. Next, we compute the division, which we defined earlier. And finally, we convert the result back into its integer form. And there we go. 3 divided by 1 equals 3. Yay, we did it! We reconstruct the division from scratch. There is one small technicality, though. How do we know this actually works? What if, for example, maybe it turns out 1 plus 1 equals 3? Or what if 4 divided by 2 equals 8? Those things are not true, by the way. You can check them. But how do we know everything else works like normal? I mean, we can't check every single equation. Very good question. And the answer is what you learn at university. Something called the field axioms. The field axioms are a list of 12 special rules that our number system has to satisfy in order to be guaranteed that it works properly. Yeah, but if any one of these 12 special rules fail, very bad things happen. Well, actually no, it depends. Like if number 11 fails, the inverse axiom, that one's not so bad. We can still do maths without the inverse. But we lose a little bit of structure. Our number system becomes a little bit harder to work with, and certain things that we take for granted in standard arithmetic no longer work. On the other hand, if number 3 fails, transitivity, that's bad. Ooh, that's really, really bad. Extremely difficult to do anything without transitivity. Anyway, it doesn't matter because luckily our number system of fractions does obey the field axioms. All 12 of them. It isn't trivial though. We actually have to go through each axiom one by one and prove it. But that'll take way too long, so I'll leave that to you. Red, come on man, let's build this wheel algebra already. Mmm, not yet. There's still one more thing. Don't worry, it'll be quick. I want to create a geometric interpretation of these fractions. Then we can use it to watch our wheel algebra as it's being constructed. We start with the empty Cartesian plane. Now we take the fraction 0, 1, and we plot this fraction at the point 0, 1. Okay, next we do the fraction 0, 2, and we plot it at 0, 2. And then we do 0, 3, and 0, 4, and so on, and we plot all the other fractions and fill the entire plane with this giant lattice of fractions. Each point in this lattice corresponds to one of our fractions. But it's not that simple, because not all the fractions are different. Many of them are equal to each other. Like, you know, 1, 1 equals 2, 2 equals 3, 3, and so on. In fact, turns out all the fractions on this line are equal to each other. So let's connect them. Yeah. And let's do the same for all the other fractions as well. Connect every line of fractions which are equal to each other. Alright, but why have I made all these dotted lines in the middle? There's no mathematical reason, actually. Yeah, those lines should really be filled in. But if I do that, this diagram is going to get really messy. So instead, I'm actually going to delete all the middle lines entirely. Don't get me wrong, they're still there, but, well, let's just say they're invisible. Don't worry about it too much. It's not important for what we're going to do. It's just a visual aid. Alright, and also let's get rid of the x and y axis. Okay, super fast recap. We defined a fraction to be a pair of integers, second one not zero. We define equality. We've defined addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And we've got this pretty little picture to visualize it all. Okay, finally, it is time for the wheel. The goal is to define division by zero without any exceptions. And also we want to try to retain as much structure as we can in our number system. So let's begin with a naive approach. We originally define a fraction as a pair of integers where the second integer was not zero. So, um, what if we just did not do that? What if we allowed the second integer to be zero? What happens? Okay, now we can write the fraction one zero. And we also have two zero, and three zero, and so on. So visually, what we've done is introduced these new black points. But there's more. 1, 0 is equal to 2, 0. You can check this. It follows directly from our definition of equality. 
and negative 1, 0, negative 2, 0 are also equal, all of them are equal, so these black points are all connected on a line. Alright, so is this a wheel algebra? Mm, no, nah. not a wheel algebra. There is a major problem hidden in this. Consider the equation 1, 2 equals 0, 0. Is this true? We can check. Yes, it is. And likewise, 0, 0 is equal to 1, 3. However, 1, 2 equals 1, 3 is false. This is a big problem. Remember the field axioms I mentioned earlier? Well, this violates number 3, the transitivity axiom. Not good. For example, let's say you were trying to solve something really simple, like this. I mean, come on, it's already done for us. 2 minus 1 equals 1. But no, you can't conclude x equals 1. You can't. Because equality isn't transitive. So you're stuck. What? Hey, now you see the problem. Do not mess with equality. It is dangerous. But the real killer here is this fraction. 0, 0. It equals everything. Remember in part 1, 0 over 0, the black hole? 0 over 0 sucks all the numbers into it and annihilates them. Yeah, that's what's going on here. Alright then, how can we fix this? I have an idea. What if we modify equality with an exception? For example, why don't we try neither b or d can be 0? Hmm. Hey, this might actually work, because 1, 2 equals 0, 0 is false now. I mean, yes, it still satisfies AD equals BC, but that doesn't matter, because it fails our new exception, D can't be 0. And likewise, 0, 0 equals 1, 3 is also false. In fact, 0, 0 equals anything will be false now. This looks promising. What about 1, 0 equals 2, 0? No, this is false as well. And so is 2, 0 equals 3, 0. Anything with a second zero will be false. So visually, in our diagram, what we've effectively done is disconnected all of the black points. There's no black line anymore. Each point is its own little floating island. Is this a wheel algebra? You might be surprised to hear the answer is still no. It's not, but we are getting closer. We have fixed equality now, but there's a new problem here you might not expect. Consider this, 1, 1 equals 2, 2. Clearly, this is true. But now, let's add 1, 0 to both sides. On the left-hand side, we get 1, 0. And on the right-hand side, we get 2, 0. But hang on a minute. 1, 0 does not equal 2, 0. Oh, ha, we fixed equality. But now addition is broken. <sighs> wow, this is hard. We can't even add things to both sides anymore. Nah, man, like, say we wanted to solve a simple linear equation. But no, we can't do it, because we can't even move the 3 over to the other side. It's just stuck there. Addition is broken. Oh, come on, this is impossible. But it's not impossible. There is a way to fix this. What we need to do is connect our black points on a line, but not the point 0, 0. Okay? 0, 0, the black hole number must be separated from the others, otherwise he will eat someone. To achieve this, we need to modify equality with three cases. There's our normal AD equals BC case, for, you know, standard everyday fractions. But now we get these two new cases when B and D are both zero for our new special fractions with a zero denominator. And finally, this is a wheel algebra. This is a wheel! Wow, you actually made it. Well done. I give you this sticker. Here you go. All that is left to do now is convert everything into standard notation like before. Well, almost. Almost like before. We redefine the integers with the same rule. The integer x equals the fraction x1. But this time, we also introduce two new numbers. Infinity, defined as the fraction 1, 0. And the black hole number defined as 0, 0. Let's do some examples. 1 plus infinity. First, convert everything into fraction form. Then compute the sum. Then convert everything back. There we go. 
1 plus infinity equals infinity. Of course, 2 plus infinity is also infinity, and any number plus infinity equals infinity, except for infinity plus infinity itself. You can try it if you want. Infinity plus infinity spits out the black hole number. Interesting. And similarly, any number times infinity is also infinity, except for zero times infinity. Yep, you guessed it. Zero times infinity equals the black hole number. Any number minus infinity equals infinity, except for infinity itself, which equals the black hole number. Any number divided by infinity is zero, and infinity divided by any number is infinity, except for infinity itself, which equals the black hole number, of course. And last of all, any number divided by zero equals infinity, except for zero over zero, the black hole number strikes again. Does this all look familiar? Look carefully. It should. It's almost identical to what we saw in part one, with the extended projection. Exactly the same, except this time, the exceptions are not undefined anymore. They are all equal to the black hole number. So you can think of a wheel algebra as an extended projection, plus this extra point in the middle, the black hole number. And that is where the name wheel algebra comes from. Alright, now for some interesting properties. 1 plus the black hole number. What is that? No worries, we can calculate it like normal. Turns out to be the black hole again. What about 2 plus the black hole number? Same thing. What about 2 times the black hole? Yep. What about 0 times the black hole? Yep. What about black hole minus black hole? Yes. Infinity divided by black hole? Yes. It's always the black hole. The black hole number absorbs everything it touches, even infinity, and even itself. Yeah, it is a very dangerous number. Kind of annoying to be honest, it screws up a lot of nice things we take for granted. For example, normally 0 times x is always 0, for any number x. This identity is very important for solving quadratic equations. You know, when you factor the left hand side and make the right hand side equal to 0. But in wheel theory, 0 times x is not always 0. Specifically, it fails for the black hole number. And actually, it also fails for infinity as well. Okay, and how did we do with the field axioms? Did we break any? Yes, of course we did. It's impossible to divide by 0 without breaking any of them. But we did pretty well. We broke the two inverse axioms. Yeah, it's pretty clear both infinity and the black hole number breaks them. But we also broke the distributive axiom. And this one isn't so obvious. What's wrong with distributivity? There. That's what's wrong. Left hand side, 2 minus 1 is infinity times 1 is infinity. On the right hand side, 2 times infinity minus infinity is the black hole number. And infinity does not equal the black hole number. Distributivity failed. We don't have distributivity but we do have something very similar. Just an extra 0x term, and this identity is always true in wheel algebra. Try it if you want. Checks out. Some more interesting properties. If you have a really long product of variables like this, you can actually take out all the zero terms to the outside for free. Yeah, you don't have to expand the brackets or multiply anything. Furthermore, we can collect the zero terms but they don't add together, instead they multiply together. Okay, that's enough now, I've got to finish up. But there's one more thing that's still bugging me. Is this the only type of wheel algebra there is? Or are there other ones? Other wheels. I'll tell you the answer. Yes, there are other wheels. And I will show you a few of them in part 3. And then there's also the problem of, what are all the different types of wheel algebras? Yeah, turns out that is currently an unsolved problem. We don't know. It's a highly active area of research. And by that, I mean there's probably like one guy in the world somewhere trying to figure it out. Anyway, I hope this video made you learn something. Bye.